Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining tonight's Northshire Presents virtual event with Tom Wessels and Wendy Gordon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Here, as I so often am these days with my friend and co-host, David Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont. Um, before we get started, a couple of very quick notes. Um, first of all, as you're coming in, you may notice that this evening's event is being recorded for future broadcast on our YouTube channel. Um, however, fear not, it, the settings are such that it will only record those of us who are unmuted and speaking. So if you want to have your camera on, you may, you will not be recorded for posterity. Um, in light of that, please use the chat box to ask any questions that you have at all this evening. Um, Davith and I will be interviewing our authors. We have a bunch of questions for them, but we would love to ask yours. Um, so type them in the chat and we will happily pose them for you. Um, and then last of all, before I turn things over to Davith to introduce our guest tonight, a word of thanks. Um, independent book selling is never an easy gig. Um, it is a, a hard business and this last year and a half have been extra hard. Um, and the Northshire bookstores really owe their continued existence to the incredible loyalty and support of our incredible customers. So thank you so much for that um, incredible support that you've given us and continue to give us and uh, for being here with us tonight. And David, why don't you introduce our guest tonight? Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, well, welcome to a really special event tonight. Uh, we have two authors with their new books on exploring New England's unique natural areas. First off, we've got Thomas Wessels for his new book, New England's Roadside Ecology. Tom is a terrestrial ecologist and professor emeritus at Antioch University, New England, where he founded the master's degree program in conservation biology. He's conducted workshops on ecology and sustainability throughout the country for over three decades. He's the author of numerous books, including Reading the Forested Landscape, The Myths of Progress, and Granite, Fire, and Fog, Natural and Cultural History of Acadia. His latest, New England's Roadside Ecology, which the Boston Globe has been has called an exciting, and has, which has been called, including by the Boston Globe, exciting, a must-have guide for outdoor enthusiasts and tourists. We are also lucky to be joined by Wendy Gordon, the author uh, or lead adventurer of 50 Hikes with Kids New England. She's the winner of the National Outdoor Book Award. A former educator, Wendy has worked as a National Geographic Fellow in Australia, researching Tasmanian devils, a polar trek leader, teacher, researcher in archaeology in Alaska, an Earthwatch teacher fellow in the Bahamas and New Orleans, and a Go North teacher exploring studying climate change via dog sled in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Today, she's a global education consultant who has traveled more than 50 countries to design programs, build communities, and train edu other educators. 50 Hikes with Kids New England is a guide of hikes that are perfect for little legs and are all under five miles. Included here are also the essential details, maps, and even scavenger hunts. Uh, so please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Thomas Wessels and Wendy Gordon. Um, Tom, why don't you start by uh, telling us a little bit about New England's roadside ecology? Okay, glad to. Um... So I guess it was back in April of 2019, I got an email from Stacy Lawrence, who's the acquisitions editor at Timber Press, asking if I'd be interested in writing a, a book on the natural history of New England. And she offered a few ideas. And also in the email, she mentioned uh, the roadside geology series. And, and many states have a roadside geology book that basically just alerts people to stops they can make on a road within the state that will show them a really cool feature, like maybe a thrust fault or you know glacial potholes or something like that. And I thought, well, that's an intriguing thing. I'd never thought about that from an ecological standpoint. So I took that idea in this book, um, instead of stopping a single point, is stopping at a trailhead parking lot for a trail that takes people into really unique natural areas in New England. And then um, we decided to do 30 sites for this book throughout the New England region. Uh, all had to have good parking accommodations. They all had to have public access and good, well-developed trail systems. And we wanted a lot of sites that were pretty easy. Um, so a lot of the sites are a mile to two miles in length. Some are getting up to four, uh, but most are easy, a few moderate and a few are, are, are I'd say difficult. Um, but the idea was to open these up to people to give them an idea of the real cool stuff you can see in these natural areas. So I'm basically, doing an interpretive trail guide to those sites, pointing out um, 
the unique features that can be seen, <clears throat> which can be ecological, natural history oriented, geological, whatever else. And each chapter or each site is, uh, has about a dozen photographs with it. So people can see these things and also sort of know um, where they are on the trail with reference to the writing. Now, when I first started getting the idea, I, I really um, had a sort of internal debate going because I thought, well, gee whiz, these are really cool areas. And if this book becomes popular, it's gonna increase the amount of hiking pressure in those sites. So the introduction is all really dedicated to talking about hiker etiquette and how people need to just stay on the trails in these sites because they're really wonderful. And if people start going off trail, they're gonna be degraded. Uh, I also mentioned that um, children are a really good way to learn trail etiquette because when I do um, programs up here in Acadia National Park with families and I have young kids um, and we get up into these really fragile outcrop communities on the granite domes, um, I'll teach the, the people, including the children, where they can place their feet. They can place their feet on crustos lichen covered granite. If they do that, they can walk anywhere. Um, but I tell them not to walk anything else, not on folios lichens or mosses, not to step even on bare sand in depressions or crevices, because those are sites that used to have uh, vegetation in these depressed and, and crevice communities. And people don't walk in them, they'll revegetate. Well, the kids really get this. It's hard for parents uh, and adults to get this, but the kids get it. I don't know if it's like, you know, step on a crack, you break your mother's back. I don't know what it is, but once they've gotten it, and I think also kids are looking more downward than it views. I've noticed that. So they're often looking down around them at closer items. So they quickly get it. And I've seen time and again, a child say, dad, look where your feet are. You're standing like in the sand or something like that. So I found that kids, if you train them, become great teachers for the rest of us. Um, so that's sort of um, the idea behind the book. And uh, it was a really fun book to work on because a lot of these areas I already knew about. I, there were some new ones I found, but it was just a joy to go out to them, walk the trails, you know, take trail notes, photograph them and stuff. And uh, the writing was pretty easy after that. So it was, a, it was a nice book to work on. Thank you so much, Tom. I've got some questions for you, but um, first uh, let me ask Wendy, tell us about um, 50 Hikes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me here. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for coming and getting inspired about uh, what all the beauty that New England has to offer for both you and your kiddos. Um, like Tom mentioned, um, his book is all about noticing and for 50 Hikes with Kids, we've really designed it to be put in the hands of kids. Um, it's super kid friendly. It's color maps. We've got a scavenger hunt of five um, items per, uh, per hike that we have. And the idea is that you put this in the hands of your kids and they're the ones who are looking and saying, oh, I want to go to a fire tower or can we go to a falls or I really want to summit something or get on top of something. Um, so we really want to inspire um, nature loving families, hike loving families, and also so that they can start to be a conversation um, with you about the things that they notice and see. Even on the seasons, we encourage families to kind of go back and revisit some of these hikes, see how it changes from March to October, um, and start to see some of these changes. I actually interviewed Tom for my book to say, Tom, how do we get our kids when, you know, I'm trying to get them to identify a species of flower or mushroom or a type of rock? Uh, and I asked Tom, how do we help kids start to build that muscle of noticing? Um, and Tom told me, that, you know, we don't have to work too hard because they do look and they are looking around more so often than uh, their parents. So thanks, Tom, for inspiring um, some of the philosophy in this book. And we've spread it all across the six states of New England. So we hope to inspire your families to get out of your own state and see all of the beauty and uh, magnificence that New England has to offer. Thanks so much, Wendy. Um, well, I'm, I would like to start with a question for the both of you. Um, and so Tom, let's start with Tom. What is the best outdoor adventure advice that you've ever received? Outdoor adventure advice? Um, I'd say to be aware of where you are. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll put this into context. Oftentimes, not in the sites that I'm writing about in this book, but other sites, I will bushwhack off trail in areas where people usually don't go. And um, I feel comfortable doing that because one thing I've learned is to always turn around and look back when I'm doing that. 
about every few hundred meters to find a, you know, sort of a mark that tells me where I am. It might be a, a tip tree or a glacial boulder or something. So I'm making a metal map of where I'm going. So when I get to the point where I'm gonna turn around, I can just follow those features back. And so I think if you're gonna be outdoors in areas you don't know, um, it's really good to do something like that. So you know where you are. Uh, GPS units can fail. And if you're out in a place and you're relying on that and they fail, you're in trouble. So it would be far better to just really know where you are by observing how you're moving through that landscape and knowing the features that will take you back. Yeah, I'll add on to that too, of just being, really there's no bad weather, it's, it's just bad preparation, right? And so for families, even more so, it's um, having that positive attitude, right? Because it is gonna rain, it is gonna be muddy, maybe you can't even see the view at the top of the fire tower that you just worked so hard to go up. So really um, having that positive attitude um, that your kids will just instantly kind of uh, mirror back to you. Um, and likewise, we kind of help kids pack their own adventure bags. We look at the forecast for the day, we help think of, you know, what are the layers we might need? Um, you know, how much water do we might, might we need? Helping um, that conversation be with your kids and not just, okay, I'm gonna plan and pack everything myself. And then my kids won't even know that they need to, uh, you know, have water because it's a hotter day or, um, you know, might need to have an extra layer if it gets windy. Help the kids come to that conclusion and, and think about that themselves and even wear their own packs. <laughs> We're now just getting to the stage of our family um, is getting into backpacking. And and you know, you you take what you want. And uh, our family wanted to bring a bunch of games, and it was like, hmm, if you want to bring them, you got to hold them. Uh, so I do encourage a lot of that empowering your own kids to help you prepare, um, and having that great attitude once you get out there, uh, despite what might happen on the trail, trying to keep that positivity. I would love to hear from both of you if there was a, a defining outdoor experience that you remember from your own childhoods that sort of set you on this path towards the work that you do now? Well, I can start. It's, it's probably not what you're gonna expect, um, but I think it's important for people to understand. When I was five, my mom developed mental illness and I was at home with her alone. My older siblings were off at school. My dad was traveling a lot at that point and it got scary at times. And I ended up taking off on my own and heading across the street into the woods that were across the street. And that woodland sort of became my sanctuary. And um, I bonded with that place. Uh, it was really sort of my true home. And uh, I could wander far in those woods as a five-year-old and not get lost because I, I think developed the ability to identify the different parts of the forest by the different types of trees, even though I didn't know what they are, didn't know what they were. And I was giving a talk on this just after my mother died because I hadn't mentioned it to anyone before that. But I think that you know, I'm sure that there are other families that have mental illness and it's important to talk about these things. And one of my colleagues in the psychology department at Antioch said, you know, Tom, we don't think that was an innate ability of yours to be able to navigate through the woods. We think that was a coping skill that you needed to develop so that you would feel safe and know how to get back home and stuff. But that was very my beginning with becoming bonded to the natural world because that was where I felt safe. That's so special, Tom. I mean, I think um, for me growing up, um, I was 100% uh, inspired by my own family. They took uh, us out on road trips out to, you know, the deserts of California and the largest trees in the world and in, in the redwoods and just really got exposed to, to this adventurous lifestyle, which turned me into a lifelong hiker um, and turned me into an educator um, to try to inspire um, other children to fall in love with nature and be excited about that. Um, and what I found out when I was, um, you know, starting to build my own hiking guidebook uh, plethora on my bookshelves, I realized that they are, um, most of them are geared to an adult reading them. And I really wanted to, I think back to me when my mom and dad took me out on these road trips and go hiking, I kind of was just following them along, but I would have loved to have been planning and choosing my own or even starting to identify some of the stuff when I was out there. So um, as a former classroom educator and science educator, I wanted to develop a book that would kind of bring that same experience to all of my students because I knew a lot of my students didn't have that same exposure. So I was hoping that maybe if they picked up this book, they could get that exposure and experience 
excitement um, and interest in exploring what they have around them. That's when thank you both. Um, I've got a question for Tom now. And so what first, well, the question is sort of what first piqued your interest in discovering sort of the forensics of natural places in New England, but, but more than that, how would you describe your, your process of these, these forensics or the forensics of the forest? So I guess um, I was really into natural history guides when I was in college. I had a leather satchel, army satchel that could hold four Peterson's guides, and I was just out identifying everything. But when I did my graduate work out in Colorado, um, that shifted because my mentor out there, a guy named John Marr, uh, I was a TA for his plant communities class, and he'd take, a, you know, he'd take his class up in the front range of the, of the uh, of the, the, the Rockies there behind Boulder. And he'd say, all right, here's this Douglas fir forest. Here's this uh, ponderosa pine forest. Tell me why they're, they're differing here. And we had, I mean, the, the undergraduates come to me saying, Tom, I'd be, help us out. And I was clueless, but um, it was really good because he just threw it right in the middle of it. And we had to just start thinking on our own and coming up with hypotheses and things. But he was the one that sort of introduced this process of reading forest histories. And so when I came to New England, um, I incorporated it right away. And of course, New England's much, much more complex because it has um, many, many more disturbance factors going on than in Colorado, where you have fire, you have logging, you have wind, but that's pretty much it when you're getting up in the mountains. But here, you've got this agricultural overlay, you've got different types of storms. You've got nor'easters and hurricanes and thunderstorm microbursts. And, um, so it, it, it was really fun to actually have to teach myself about how to interpret these new areas. So it's, it, I, I call it forest forensics because it's not unlike going to a crime scene and gleaning an area for evidence um, to explain exactly what has happened in the past. So by doing that, I can tell not only if an area is once open agricultural land that's now forested, I can, I can tell if it was a crop field or a hay field or a pasture. I can tell when it was abandoned. I can tell if it's been logged, how many times it's been logged, when it's been logged, um, if it's been hit by a blowdown, what type of storm it was, when it occurred. Um, so it's all based on the evidence that's left from those disturbances, which stick around for quite a long time. In fact, um, just the other day, I was out in a site where I found evidence of a hurricane that happened sometime before 1500. Um, I can't determine exactly when, I just know it's before 1500, but it could have been the 1300s, 1200s, 1100s, who knows. But uh, the evidence like that can last for a good amount of time. Real quick, what is the evidence? I'm just curious. What's that? What is the evidence of the old hurricane? I'm curious. Well, the, the so, Let's say uh, in here, you know, let's say that this hurricane tracks so that the winds came out of the southeast. So all the trees blew down to the northwest, the roots ripped up out of the ground. So this makes what's called pit and mound or pillow and cradle topography. So where the roots ripped out of the ground, you get this depression that's called a pit or a cradle. And then the upturned roots of the tree as it rots, that excavated earth is settles to make a mound or a pillow. So you get what's called pit and mound or pillow and cradle topography. So in this case, there was a bunch of them all lined up that I could tell were from winds out of the Southeast. That's how I knew it was a hurricane. And I knew that it happened before um, 1500 because there were the remains of um, chestnut stumps of trees that had grown on these pillows that had been salvaged in around 1915 because of chestnut blight. But these were stump sprouts from big old growth trees that were four to five, six feet in diameter had been cut probably back in the middle 1800s. So I knew that these big old chestnuts cut in the middle 1800s that were probably already 300 or more years old um, at time of cutting meant that they were growing up around, you know, 1550 or earlier. And that's how I knew that I'm looking at a hurricane that was like 1500 or before that. Wendy, I have a question for you too, but I'm so fascinated by this topic. Tom, have you ever collaborated with archeologists or historians when they're doing research in the area to sort of help them confirm things that they're studying? I have, I worked on a project in the Green Mountain National Forest with uh, archeologists from the Forest Service as well as the Smithsonian. Uh, there was a section of forest that had, for lack of a better word, these huge, 
rectangular rock cairns. The biggest ones were like, um, oh, probably uh, eight meters by 12 meters and maybe as much as three meters in height and flat top and there were tons of them. And uh, I was brought in to see if I could interpret the site's history. I was able to confer that these things were in a former crop field, but my assessment was there was so much rock there, I thought it was imported in. And I thought they probably predated the crop field. And I suggested that they should take one apart to look at the construction of this thing, or actually uh, do a soil core underneath it to see if you had an intact soil profile. Because if there was an intact soil profile under the Karen, that means it would have predated the crop field. So I believe they're probably of Native American origin. Uh, we brought in Abenaki elders. They didn't have any idea but thought that they might be sacred. So they asked us not to touch them. And I don't think they have been touched. So it's still a mystery what these things are. Wow, this is amazing. Thank you so much for telling us about it. Um, Wendy, um, I'd love to know what some of your favorite tips are for overcoming kids who just don't want to. Totally, I think this relates to what Tom talks about because the the trails are just naturally interesting, right? Like there's not too much you have to do. And sometimes parents um, ask me, you know, how do we engage our kids on the trail? How do we get them excited? And step one is to just go, right? To go out there. Um, step two is don't worry for parents. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to ask some questions, right? That's really all it takes is while you're hiking, you know, pointing out something and say, huh, you know, I wonder why you see that pillow and mound over there. Do you see the pattern that I see? Um, why do you think that's there, right? And you don't have to have the right answers. You might, um, you know, spur some questions to research when you get home. Let's look about that online or let's look on the satellite view on Google map. What do we see? Do we see any of bigger patterns across the state, right? So that's my number one tip is to just really question and don't worry about having all the right answers while you're out there. Um, the other thing is I do put in the book ways that you can help kids um, start to notice these things and interact with them. We bring a nature journal when we go out anywhere. And in that nature journal, we might stop um, for kind of a snack stop, which we stop all the time, right? To either eat or to play. If we see something like cool um, acorns that have fallen, let's stop and maybe we can count as many acorns as we can. Um, and then maybe again, connecting that to, well, what tree did those come from? How far did they come from? These don't have caps on them, why not? Why do you think? And then we also sometimes will sketch those, right? We might sketch the caps or we might um, collect them and trace them or trace a leaf. Um, so this is gonna be a really great way, a, a nature journal to document the fun things that you did together um, and then start to document the things you learn about nature as you're out there. Um, and it might even mean as the kids get older, they might be interested in actually sketching landscapes or seeing what's going on and then zooming out a bit to see how does this you know, square foot that I'm standing in right now, how does that connect with this whole trail? How does that connect with all the rest of the trails I've been on? And in New England, there's just such fascinating geology as well, where you're kind of seeing the remnants of glaciation all around you, just starting to put that whole pieces of puzzles together about your surroundings and kids building that awareness. Um, and my final tip is bring friends. They oftentimes parents think that they have to plan out uh, all of the adventure and you really don't all the time, right? Like get, uh, they let them have that moment where maybe it's not planned or scheduled and they lead the way they stop when they want to stop. Maybe you don't always want to, you know, stop and see what the stop on the map is. Let them stop what interests them. And maybe they just want to be out there and talk while they hike, right? Which is what um, I'm hiking a lot with teenagers now. And really that's all they want. <laughs> they want to talk with each other. They want to be um, with each other and um, talk about what they see with each other. So just a few tips, uh, Rachel, that I hope families can get to um, engage their kiddos and get them excited about being on the trail. Uh, I've got another question for both of you, but I'm going to start with Wendy this time. Um, what are, were the, the criteria for what you included in your both your books and, and why? 
Ooh, this one was so hard, right? And like, oftentimes families will ask me only 50, um, cause it's hard. Cause there is just hundreds and hundreds of beautiful trails across new England. Um, but we did develop a pretty firm kid filter. Um, we really wanted to make sure it was under five miles. Um, we know there's many hardy new England families that can tackle way more than that, but this is really geared towards maybe even that beginning hiking family. So we have start at one mile. And we do at least make sure it's one mile. So it's not like a nature trail so much as it is. It should be a true blue hike that an adult might want to do. Um, and then up to five miles. And then also try to keep it at about a thousand foot elevation or less. A thousand foot being a really good challenge for, you know, a five-year-old to kind of summit something at a thousand feet. Um, and, uh, you know, at least uh, all the way to a hundred feet, right? Where you might have a very flat trail. So that was our difficulty um, parameters. The other one was just making fairly simple routes, right? There's a lot of really great city parks and places around um, the states that uh, have, you know, convoluted ways to go. We wanted families to pick up and either have a super simple out and back or a loop or a lollipop loop um, that was pretty easy to follow, that even a kid might be able to lead the way. And then we did try to have a variety of um, items that they could see along the way. So we wanted to make sure that we had lakes and waterfalls and coast, um, and you know, we even had ice caves and we had fire towers. Um, so really wanted to make sure there was a um, you know carrot at the end, the one cool um, thing that kids would want to have their destination be. And then finally, um, making sure that there's a variety of things that they could find along the way, um, whether that's wildflowers or fauna or um, geology or history. And we actually partnered with the state geologist for each state, the state botanist, um, the state historian. And we really asked each of them, you know, if you were to tell the tale of the geology in your state or of the history of your state, in a way a four-year-old might understand. Um, and they enjoyed that task and really helped make history come alive, make the roads come alive so that kids can start to understand these things. So luckily I was not uh, at, at any um, hardship to find stuff. It was really picking the best in each. And really I tell families, you know, use this as a starter pack. We've got 10 in Maine. Um, now when you make your way up to say uh, Mount Desert, now, you know, here's how some ways that you can find other hikes in the area using all trails app and searching for kid friendly for instance this is just a taster and we hope that you get interested enough to keep finding all the other hikes that might be in the area as well and top so what what made the criteria for what you included uh, in your book and what didn't yeah, well, I think I mentioned it at the beginning in terms of public access, well-developed trail systems that could handle increased hiker traffic, uh, things like that. I want to make it accessible. Actually, I'd say six of the sites are actually handicap accessible. Um, uh, so those are some of the criteria, but I also wanted to get a diverse array of the unique natural uh, communities we have in New England. So I did one, you know, Alpine Tundra site. I did one sand dune system. Uh, I did a, three bogs, uh, a number of swamps, marshes, and then I'd say the, the bulk of them are forested sites, a lot of which have embedded old growth in them. Um, but all the sites have really unique natural history, ecology, or geology that's all pointed out, you know, on the walk. Uh, I've got a follow-up question for you, Tom. Um, and this is not a, really a follow-up question, but you mentioned earlier um, the different types of, of lichens. And I noticed in your book, you talk a lot about lichens. What, why should we um, pay attention so carefully to, to lichens? You know, the, the kids are, are seeing them and not stepping on them, but we, are, we adults are maybe stepping on them. I, don't, I just have a predilection to really like lichens. I mean, I think they're just really cool. I mean, um, one thing about them is that all lichens are cryptobiotic, which means that when their tissues dry out, they, they cease all metabolic function. So photosynthesis stops, respiration stops, everything stops. And in arid environments like down in the desert Southwest, you can get lichens that can be in that state for years and years and years. And then they get you know, a, a, a brief rainfall, they swell up and start photosynthesizing, respiring and everything else. So it's sort of like, it makes the definition of life difficult because they're turning on and off life. But not only that, 
In these lichens, you have tardigrade or water bear communities. These are microscopic invertebrates that are also cryptobiotic. And some of those tardigrades forage on the lichens. Other tardigrades are carnivores that forage on the herbivorous tardigrades. So now you have a cryptobiotic ecosystem where when it's wet, everything's functioning. You know, one tardigrade is eating another one. They dry out and everything stops. And it could be stopped like that for a day or a week or a month. And then it gets rained on or fog hits it. And all of a sudden, they're all active again. Um, and plus, they're just, they're just intriguing shapes. I think Dr. Seuss would have loved lichens because the fruticose lichens look like the type of trees that uh, Dr. Seuss used to have in his books. And I don't know, I'm just intrigued by them. But they're very fragile because when they're in that cryptobiotic state, you know, one footstep can eradicate a lichen that could be 100 years old. Um, so, uh, and there's a whole story behind the successional patterns and stuff, but I just find them uh, really, really interesting. It's why uh, my second book was The Granite Landscape, which was really just like the natural history of exposed glaciated granite domes across the country, because I'm just really intrigued by that sort of ecosystem. I love that, Tom. I mean, I think with families too, they think of you know, I had to make a decision on what level of identification we wanted to put in our scavenger hunt, right? And we could just put guild mushrooms or, you know, lichen and, and, you know, do a very high level identification. But we did go one level deeper to say, let's start to, to notice the different kinds of lichen you might see. Um, and so I think that's when you really start to open up, you know, the, the world, right? This whole world that kids didn't even know existed when you just noticed to say, huh, the stuff going on the rocks is different in different places and why, right? And then uh, helping them understand that these are indicators of how healthy our, you know, our neighborhood is, right? Like, or if we, when we travel, like, is this a healthy place or not? Or, you know, what are these, the, what's the signs of life around us? So um, I really like kind of digging in, drilling in one level deeper so that um, not to be too overwhelming, but then the kids who really are interested Interested, they're going to be the ones that want to know, dive that third level deeper to be like, I really do want to know kind of the difference between these two lichen and understand the difference between that and moss. Like, then you'll get them on their own to start to want to ask those questions and figure it out. And something else that I think is really interesting would be very interesting, not just for children, but for adults as well, is that when lichens go to the cryptobiotic stage, their colors completely change. So uh, a fun thing to do is just take your water bottle on a dry day and pour it on a lichen. And within a few seconds, you will see them transform from maybe gray to green um, or something like that. And so that can be really intriguing. And then that opens up the opportunity to start talking about what these things are and why they change like that. Um, but it catches the eye. It really is sort of a, a nice um, you know, field uh, party trick, if you say, you know, just pour water on these lichens and they will swell up and change color right before your eyes. That's amazing. I've been hiking my whole life and I never knew that. Well, now I will definitely sure. try that the next time I'm out. Go ahead. Um, what do both of you perceive as being the biggest challenge in getting kids to really engage with the outdoors? Well, I, I don't think it, there, there is a challenge. I think kids are naturally curious and they're naturally going to go for it. I think there can be a challenge if kids have been cloistered away from nature and they don't know how to interact with it or if they've been somehow not intentionally taught but gotten the idea that nature could be dangerous or whatever else, that could be a problem. But if that hasn't happened, kids are just naturally going to gravitate to it. I think we are, as humans, hardwired to want to interact with the natural world. I think it's part of who we are. It's, you know, it's our, our heritage. You know, we've... <clears throat> We've been on this planet, Homo sapiens, for 200,000 years. And for the bulk of that time, we were all living in intimate relationship with nature. It's only very, very recently that that's been disrupted. And I think that it's innate in us to want to interact. And I think it's innate in kids to do that as well. Um, yeah, you nailed it. And I think... I think what we can do as a parents and families, and sorry, there's a window window cleaner right behind me. I've been trying so good to not look at him, but he's right there. Um, I think what we can do for- There he is, I <laughs> so see he's right there. All right, we're just gonna say hi to him. <laughs> Get it out of the way, there we go. Um, so I think, you know, speaking of getting outside, I mean, this guy's got the job of being outside all day. Um, but I do think that, um, to Tom's point, 
that, um, incur, you know, one, addressing fear, um, you know, and parents have this fear too, right? We've got ticks, we've got bears, there's, you know, all sorts of interesting things that are out there that you do want to be informed on, right? And so we do in the book try to inform that and build that intelligence to, you know, say looking for ticks or understanding about what we're going into. So, um, and then really embracing things that might go wrong if there is a fall, right? How resilient kids are when things like that might happen. Um, so I think that's the first thing that parents can, you know, helping parents overcome that fear too, right? They don't want, they're, 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 they're their babies. They don't want things to happen to them. And I like that of moving from kind of helicopter parenting while you are hiking to almost, you know, a panda parenting, right? Where you might be letting them go forward with your own safety, right? Like we're not going to, you know, uh, you know, knowing what the, the limitations might be. Um, so I do think embracing that. Um, and, you know, with, with technology, I come from the world of both outdoors and tech. I love both things. Um, and so if we do have kids who sometimes parents might want to say, let's turn everything off, like, let's get out there. And yes, I advocate for unplugging 100% sometimes all the way. But that can be if you do have a reluctant kid who just, like Tom said, maybe it was never, hasn't been exposed that much to outside and, um, you know, kind of has very structured activities or structured indoor activities. Um, the first thing is just free play outdoors. Like that's probably the best thing you can do, but hiking um, guided along with you or with, um, you know, a trusted family member um, or one day on their own as they get older um, and can start to build that independence. Um, I do think that maybe technology can be a way, perhaps they want to be the person who records the length of that hike to do some fun math activities, or maybe they want to um, record the audio of birds to try to identify it later. We love using the iNaturalist Seek app, which kind of uses AR to, to recognize flowers and leaves and even butterflies pretty accurately. Um, I think with balance though, right? So you might say, okay, um, you know, we're gonna find two spots where you might be able to use your camera today or your phone um, to help us enhance what we're looking at. Um, and maybe you're in charge of it rather than kind of being buried in the phone the whole hike saying, let's leverage this cool tool to help enhance the hike we're on today. So yeah, I think those two things can help um, unleash the natural tendency that Tom mentioned is already there. Um, thanks. I'd, I'd like to ask you both about sort of some of the uniquely New England um, things or what's sort of uniquely special about New England. And you've talked a, few, a little bit about um, about them, but um, Tom, I'd like to get sort of hyper specific with some of the sort of the interesting chemistry behind uh, Orono Bog or Sacco Heath um, and what, what's so special about those conditions and how they are, how we have them here. Well, I think um, the uh, Sacco Heath is unique because it's the most southerly raised bog in, in North America. So in raised bogs, um, what that means is the center of the bog is actually higher than the surrounding area that's forested. It's raised up because um, the way this works is in a bog, once you get down below the bog mat, uh, it's anaerobic, there's no oxygen and the pH is about 3.5, it's very acidic. And once you get below there, nothing lives there. It, there's nothing that's figured out how to survive in that environment. So plants start to decay, like you know the, the sphagnum moss starts to decay, but it turns into peat. And peat is really super absorbent of water. It can pull up 200 times its own weight in water. And so as peat builds up, it's raising the bog up, but it's so, uh, so absorbent, it pulls the water level up with it. And eventually what you find in a raised bog is the water level in the center of the bog is higher than it is around its edges. Um, but anyways, I guess it's probably that anaerobic uh, acidic environment that makes it unique. There's, I mean, when you think about it, you get down underneath the bog mat, you have this incredible energy resource in the peat, you've got water, um, the temperature is very stable down there, fluctuating between, let's say, 39 degrees and about 55 degrees annually. Um, and you'd think something could figure out how to live there, but nothing has figured that out. We can have organisms living on the top of Everest, organisms living in the deepest oceanic trenches, uh, in caves uh, thousands of feet down underground, uh, even in bedrock thousands of feet underground and yet nothing has figured out how to survive in a bog just three feet below the bog surface. So I think that makes them quite cool and unique. 
I love that, Tom. We there was a really cool bog that's on Quaddy Head and way down east. Um, it's a nice one. Yeah, it's so cool. We have picture plants and like you really just walk on this boardwalk and you're like, I'm in a place that has just been around a very long time, right? And you can just very much tell um, uh, what's going on there. So I think that that history, that sense of history all across New England shows itself in different ways, right? It shows itself in kind of the glaciation I was talking about earlier. It's uh, some of the most, you know, um, the, the boulders that you see on almost every trail and wondering where do those things come from? And, you know, where do these kettle ponds come from? A, a, you know, a glacier made that and a rock made that, how? Um, so I think uh, for me, that history that, that you see naturally happening, but then also you're just, you know, seeing railroads and you're seeing um, places where George Washington looked over before, um, you know, continuing on 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 the army stretch or um crossing on the Appalachian Trail where you know thousands of people over time have you know tackled one of the longest continuous trails um in the world right and so I think um every you know the history that you can talk about um on all these different kinds of hikes are really exciting um and really the types of things you can see from either the ledges and the views or all the way to um kind of the ice caves i was talking about or uh, our fire towers it's it's really diverse in what you can and i also add um food stops for each one and, and one of the most um beautiful things about New England is kind of the regional goodies and food you might have, whether it's kind of maple creamies or popovers I was talking to Tom about up in Maine, right? So we do try to, back to what you were asking, Rachel, about enticing our kids, um, you know, food never fails to entice. And really, like, if you are going outside of your state or taking a little bit of a road trip, it's really fun that your kids might either pack up their bag with some sort of regional treat to reward themselves for the hard work they've done or treat yourself at the end of the day. I know as an adult with my hikes, that's the what I still do and look forward to after a really long hike is treating myself to that. So, um, you know, finding that, I think my favorite thing that we found was kind of these wonderful honor pie systems. They don't exist anywhere else in the world. I've only seen them in New England, right? But they're just pie stands where it says, hey, I made some fresh pies, drop a couple bucks, take your pie with you to go. Um, it's uh, really a fun part of the whole hiking experience in New England as well. My husband used to do maintenance on a trail in the Catskills that had an excellent ice cream shop near the end point of it. And uh, they made really good milkshakes. And yes, they, they were definitely something that, that were part of the day whenever we were there. Heck yeah. But I, I, I would love to ask both of you, what to you makes New England distinct? What is, what is special about New England? Well, I think um, it's sort of, for me, it's probably it's geographic setting. Um, we have, you know, ocean, coastline um, that can be very different. You know, you get into down East Maine, this rugged, rugged, rocky coast, whereas a lot of the, the rest of New England is just sandy beaches. But then you have mountains that can get up into alpine tundra. Um, and you have a mixing ground. So in New England, you're getting the mixing of the, you know, boreal coniferous forest biome with the temperate deciduous forest biome. And New, New England is that place where those two things mix. So you get a lot of species diversity because of that. So it's just in a, a relatively small area, you're getting a mix of a lot of diversity, which I think makes it pretty exciting because of its geography, mostly, um, of where, where, where it resides. Yeah, I'll add on to that as well. I think, um, I think right now that it's fall season, obviously, you cannot beat <laughs> the foliage that happens, right? And so I think that just the diversity of deciduous trees that are um, unleashing itself on the world is just so magical. So that's, of course, is one of my favorite thing. And then, of course, all the autumn goodies that, that go along with it. But back to kind of what Tom's talking about, about connecting with nature, right? That feeling the seasons and seeing a season happening is so much a part of that awareness and noticing and appreciating that we're trying to instill in our kids. And autumn is just one piece of that, right? And New England just does autumn so well um, that it's a, it really stands out to me. And another favorite part about autumn in New England is really hawk watching, right? We've got a couple of really good 
hawk watching spots um, where you can kind of see this migration happening. So I encourage folks to start to not only see the leaves that are changing with their kids, but looking up in the sky and asking those same questions of where are those guys headed and why? And uh, you know, where do you think they are going? Um, and starting to see some of these magnificent creatures for sure. Thank you. Um, what would you both recommend to um, some people who are just starting with your book? So where did it go first? Our first couple of places, if they had the you know car and time and all that. No COVID. I, I, I don't think I would recommend anyone. I think they would have to choose on their own because uh, people would be drawn to different things. And um, I think they would have to decide that themselves. So I wouldn't you know make that suggestion, I guess. Yeah, I think picking up and again, the same strategy for kids, oftentimes kids, you know, we teach about how to read fiction and nonfiction, but even hiking guidebooks are just an own genre in and of themselves. And it's not kind of a natural thing to understand how to look at the map and then how to read the table for, you know, am I interested in kind of a challenging one with higher elevation? Am I looking for lakes? Maybe I am looking for things where I could see bird watching, right? So um, I always help families start there, kind of to what Tom said, what kind of hiker are you? Or what do you like about the outdoors? Let's try to find hikes that are like that. Not every family loves, you know, say lakes or views, right? Maybe people are, your kids are really into geology and caves, you know, trying to start to fine tune your hikes and adventures towards what kids love. So I would say similarly, start with the map, start with the table of contents to see, you know, what are the features that each hike might have. Um, and of course, back to the time of year, I would say, um, you know, using our kind of great foliage watchers and finding out wh when and where um, leaves might start to be turning, where could you go that have these kinds of forests where you might see um, the types of trees that are really going to put on a show for you? Um, those are all great places to start. So Tom, you mentioned when we were getting ready for this earlier that um, this book has done so well that it's going to be the start of a series, though not necessarily one that you will be writing the entirety of. And I'd love for you to share a little bit, anything you can share about that with our audience tonight. And then Wendy, um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what's coming next with your series as well. Yeah, so I guess um, when I first floated this idea to, to Timber Press, they got very excited about it because they, they thought, well, gee, we've never seen anything quite like this before. And they thought, well, this would make a really good series. So they did. They decided they were going to make it, uh, uh, you know, into a series across the country. I know that they have someone working on one for the Pacific Northwest right now, as well as California. And um, the cover of the book, uh, they put a lot of effort into. They didn't want to make it like a normal um, sort of guide that would have, which usually has, you know, photographs of, you know, natural history subjects on it. They want it to be something with striking that would sort of settle aside. And when they first showed me the cover design, I thought, wow, that is that is pretty bold. And, um, but that's gonna be sort of the, I think the imprint for the series, all the covers are gonna have a cover like this. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that, how that all turns out, but they seem quite excited about it. That's great news, Tom, for someone who loved the book. And I just think the whole, notion of forensics and understanding um, is well worth many other regions. So excited for that. And likewise here, um, uh, I started out in Oregon, Washington, California. And so this is our third book. Um, as Rachel put in the chat, we have New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, which is a whole nother amazing world of geology, history, and, and natural world um, for families to explore. And hopefully New England families too can come on down and vice versa. Again, we're trying to inspire that um, road tripping adventure in all of you. Um, but we're partnering with amazing co-authors in um, some of our other Eastern states. So we have the Mid-Atlantic and we have an amazing mom and professor out there who's gonna be co-writing um, our DC, Virginia, West Virginia, which is incredible, um, beautiful area out there. We've got a co-author in Texas, a co-author in uh, Indiana, um, Illinois and Ohio, um, and also Colorado, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. So watch out. We've got a whole bunch of families who are um, the most adventurous of families I've ever met who are going to co-write these um, upcoming books with me. Um, and hopefully one day we'll cover the whole U.S. of uh, helping families um, start to explore and identify the nature around them. 
Um, thanks to thank you both. I'm afraid we're, we're almost out of time, but I do have one last question for you both. And that is, what's something that didn't make it into the final book that you're really sad couldn't make it in? Well, one site I was going to put in, it was uh, Sugarloaf Mountain in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Um, and I decided not to put it in because uh, I hadn't been up on that. It was It's a granite exposed glaciated granite dome, and I hadn't been up on that summit for about six or seven years. And when I went back up there, uh, the outcrop communities have been pretty much eradicated by people just walking all over the place. So all you had was just crustose lichens and exposed big beds of sand in the depression communities. And so um, it was a disappointment, but um, I decided not to write about it. I might've, maybe I should have written about it as sort of instructive saying, well, this is what happens when people, you know, um, get up to a place like this and don't respect where they're placing their feet and maybe have photographs I had taken previously of what it looked like versus what it looks like today, but I decided not to put it in. That's hard, Tom. I know it's uh, with 50 hikes for me, it, it's hard. We've got a lot on the cutting room floor, so much so that we and now it didn't make it to New England, but it will make it for New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. We will have an honorable mention page, which will have a hundred of all the things that were on the cutting room floor. But in this case, I was really sad to lose. Um, one thing that we practice closely is leave no trace. And we help families understand how to leave the forest better than you found it, of course. Um, but if any of you have ever spent time with kids, you know, fairy houses, are um, just a natural thing to do when you find cool things that are sitting on the ground. And so we did have, um, you know, some pictures and encouraging, you know, creativity with things that are abundant on the ground that you can kind of leave when you're done maybe. Um, but we also work closely with rangers and they, of course, they know that anything like that when scaled out can be hard and uh, hard to tell folks, uh, you know, the next step, which might be taking things or things like that. So I did have to make a compromise to say, okay, we'll, we'll leave the pictures of the fairy houses out um, in, you know, spirit of trying to encourage as much leave no trace as possible. But um, our, our family still loves to, if we find something cool, we like to arrange something interestingly, but always kind of leave things uh, the way that you found it for sure. <laughs> Thank you both. This has been such an interesting conversation. I've really enjoyed hearing from both of you. Um, audience, thank you for being here with us tonight. You can order both um, New England's Roadside Ecology and 50 Hikes with Kids New England from Northshire.com. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Great to chat with you, uh, David and uh, Rachel. Thank you so much for hosting us and thank you all for joining. We hope to see you out on the trails. Have a wonderful fall uh, out in New England. Thank you all both so much. And uh, we'll see you at another North Shire Presents uh, of evening soon. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.